another day dawns in the Pine Barrens, a globally significant forest type scattered throughout the northeastern United States in areas such as the New Jersey Pine Lands, Cape Cod Pine Barrens, Albany Pine Bush, and here on Long Island, the Central Pine Barrens. This natural wonder, barely 50 miles east of Manhattan, typifies these pine barrens. More than 100,000 acres are located within the central and eastern portion of Suffolk County, New York. The center of this area is a mosaic of pitch pine and pine oak forests, coastal plain ponds, marshes, and streams. A rich landscape of terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems, interconnected surface and groundwater, recreational opportunities, historic locales, farmland, and residential communities. It's one of the rarest forest types in North America. The question of how long has the Pine Barrens been here is, is one that's answered in terms of thousands of years. Uh, several thousand years would be a minimum answer. If we have fire records, uh, charcoal indicators, for example, in the soil that show that fires have occurred for hundreds and even, in some cases, thousands of years. So the Pine Barrens and certainly its whole fire adaptive nature has been around for probably long before European contact and well into the Native American era. It's a tremendous habitat for wildlife, and it's really unique in New York State in its value to wildlife. Its coastal location also makes it incredibly important for migratory birds as well, and it's also extremely important for our water supply. There's certainly uh, dozens of bird species available to, for spotting in the Pine Barrens from dawn to dusk. There's some mammals. There are uh, plenty of hunting opportunities in terms of uh, of, of deer, uh, upland game. There is uh, a number of duck hunting areas. In fact, much of the Pine Barrens was originally preserved because portions of it were in hunting clubs, hunting and fishing clubs dating back to the turn of the last century. Probably the recreational activities have long been the reason that people are attracted to the central Pine Barrens, whether it's hiking, hunting, fishing, canoeing, boating, or just the relaxation. <laughs> Each year, hundreds and sometimes thousands of acres of the Pine Barrens are swept by wildfires. These fires jeopardize homes and businesses in the wildland-urban interface, where the forest meets development. It, it's always dangerous. You just don't know what's going on. You have fire. You saw today, fire shifted direction a number of times. We've seen it just make, turn full circles on us. So even though we've got the best precautions in place and all the right safety equipment, you know, things do happen out there. Damage to the environment it can also be significant because we have a lot of smoke developed, which uh, may or may not present problems. And of course, we damage the, uh, the forests themselves. The big problem is left uncontrolled. These fires can threaten public safety, communities, and they can do damage to the whole environment. There is a, a significant risk to uh, human life as well, uh, primarily to the firefighters who are in the middle of the firefight. We've had some very serious injuries, unfortunately. We're vigorously investigating arson fires. Uh, we exchange information. We work closely with the fire marshal office of Suffolk County and of the town fire marshals. Also the arson squad of Suffolk County Police. Uh, we put the word out in the community to keep an eye on the properties, to take license plate numbers, to give us what we can do, the tools needed uh, to go after these uh, people that are doing this destruction to our Pine Barrens. Wildfires in the Pine Barrens are primarily caused by the human hand and 95% of the fires that do occur, those thousand or so fires, uh, are started in that manner. And then you have a, a very small percentage that uh, are caused by, by other means, natural or otherwise. Fires started by humans fall into two categories. The first are accidental fires that result from carelessness, usually with campfires, smoking materials, illegal fireworks, and illegal off-road vehicles. The other category is arson, including fires deliberately set for a variety of motives. Arsonists can include both adult and juvenile fire setters, who often set fires for curiosity or excitement. 
due to improvements in forensic fire investigation, interagency cooperation, and patrols, these crimes against nature and human life are being prosecuted more effectively than ever. Uh, on the East Coast, while we do have a lot of storms and, and weather blows through all the time and we get uh, plenty of lightning, copious amounts of lightning, uh, lightning is not as much a hazard here as it is in the West. And, and that's because in, on the East Coast, generally when you have a storm with lightning, it's, rain is associated with that system. Although fire can be a destructive force, it is a natural phenomenon that plays a vital role in shaping various ecosystems. Many species of plants and animals have evolved under fire disturbance regimes. Fire can occur in all Pine Barrens habitats. Some habitats have long time intervals between fires. Climate, weather, vegetation, human disturbance, and soils determine the frequency of fire in the area. Some Pine Barrens habitats on Long Island have historically had short intervals between fires, largely due to their flammable vegetative composition and dry soils. Fire has played an active part in maintaining the Pine Barrens over the last several thousand years. The rejuvenation of the pitch pine depends on periodic fire to germinate its seeds. During the past two centuries, the Pine Barrens has experienced several major fires and numerous smaller fires. Concern for wildfires has grown over the years due to the increase in wildland urban interface areas. A wildland urban interface is where the forest edge meets development. This draws more public concern over the potential for significant property loss where historically only pine trees stood. Well, the Pine Barrens is what we call a fire-adapted ecosystem. Uh, depending on where you are in the Pine Barrens, fire plays a slightly different role. But in all cases, all portions of the Pine Barrens, fire is an integral part. It's been a part for thousands of years, and it's not going away anytime soon. Uh, the preservation of the Pine Barrens rather guarantees that we're always going to be dealing with fire as a management issue. Then you go back 60 years and you, and you judge out all the fires and average them all out. In the course of the past 60 years, for a two-year period, uh, every two years you can estimate you'd have a 500-acre fire or bigger. Uh, and that's just the averages. This is a News 12 Long Island special report. This afternoon, uh, the situation in Riverhead, uh, West Hampton area, large brush fire apparently uh, burning and getting larger as we speak. We've still got some companies tied down uh, over by, uh, uh, by Rocky Point uh, because they're concerned with these high winds with a flare-up over there, and then Medford uh, became a problem. So uh, it, it's all over the county at this point, and uh, it stretches the resources thin. So when the call came in, I was uh, mowing my lawn, and I figured it at it would be a typical maybe one hour or a couple hour type of situation. The 1995 wildfires was extreme fire weather behavior. We had complete firestorm conditions, uh, whole trees burning, uh, flame lengths uh, 30 to 40 feet in the air, extreme wind conditions. You even had extreme wind conditions at night. The wind didn't even die down at night. Well, what I remember is I was driving down to sunrise and looked over into the north here and saw a uh, big cloud of smoke and uh, I knew it was between me and the college uh, uh, complex behind us here and uh, I knew I was in trouble because we'd been already uh, up to Rocky Point for the last three or four days and that morning they still had some of the, the close mutual aid trucks that we use. Uh. We've had dozens maybe hundreds of brush fires over the years and we always seem to get them out without that big a deal and uh, I think, uh, Jimmy, we thought it was pretty hot that day, didn't we, when it blew by us on Spank Riverhead yep. Road? The flames are very high up in the air, and, and they're basically traveling on the trees. It, it's moving at such a powerful speed and such a, with such strong force that it, like, flew over as if it just jumped, as if you jumped over a line. It doesn't look like Sunrise Highway itself is actually burning. It, it more hopped over. When the fire crossed Spank Riverhead Road, and was heading towards the Sunrise Highway, we were basically breathing a sigh of relief. We were hoping that the fire break of Sunrise Highway would be more than sufficient enough for us to stop the fire and actually prevent it from going any further. And when it jumped Sunrise Highway before us, it was a, a fire condition I had never witnessed in my fire service career. It basically crossed Sunrise Highway like it was a two foot wide road and just continued to burn on the other side just as fierce. It got in the top of the trees 
and then it caused its own draft and it went through here faster than you could run. And that's, that was one of the major problems. It was just traveling faster than four or five departments could handle. You never actually run out of a manpower. It, it gets extremely low. They, remembering that this was in August, it was very warm, so the fatigue set in rather quickly. The gear is very hot, very heavy. This took place, off fire took place primarily during weekdays when many of the members have to work. And it, it, we were really sapped for help, but uh, that's why you keep calling in your neighbors. And if each neighbor can send you half a dozen or so, you put them all together and you have something. But we had everybody from Long Island, from Nassau, Suffolk County, uh, one from Shelter Island, New York City, uh, Staten Island. You talk about a lot of people. One thing with the mutual aid system, uh, most of the fire departments, Jimmy mentioned, we never worked with before, but firemen know how to work with each other. So totally, people from out of the county even would, could work right with another truck, piece of apparatus from uh, an area, fire department here, and have no problem at all. And it really worked out well that way. It was kind of like organized chaos. Uh, the, the cause of the Rocky Point fires was actually undetermined in the end. However, we believe that it was, ca it was caused by humans uh, associated with some uh, activities, whether it be carelessness or illegal access on the properties. Well, there are two types of fuel. The first are the fine fuels, such as the leaves, sedges, the pine needles, the grasses. And the second type are the heavy fuels, such as logs or tree trunks. A number of items can affect how a brush fire burns. Among them are relative humidity. Um, going uphill, a fire tends to burn much quicker than it does going downhill. Also, you will see the fine fuels ignite more readily than the heavy fuels. From a prevention standpoint, the uh, local community leaders, uh, the fire service, and the general public can do a tremendous amount to help prevent uh, wildland fires. Anything that's going to be done to uh, change or alter uh, that area, uh, planning should be done first and foremost. Uh, planning from the point of view or perspective from the, the uh, private people, the public, uh, and also the fire service and the public safety area. Um, planning as far as knowing the distances, uh, the growth, the vegetation in that area, making sure there's plenty of clearance and distance from the property line so that uh, the potential for uh, an accidental fire will not spread to the wildland areas. Planning in the, the public sector, uh, uh, governmental agencies, uh, making sure that there is good access, that the people in that community are aware of uh, the potential danger um, and how to help avoid it. Uh, and planning also from the fire service perspective, uh, knowing the target hazard and uh, how they're going to approach it, where their water sources are uh, to help fight it. Uh, all those things fall under the area of planning. I just want to do the PPE safety check for everyone who's working the burn, who's working the line. They need to have these items. You need to have a hard hat, you need to have ear protection, eye protection, leather gloves, leather boots, no mix shirt, no mix pants, and a fire shelter. Everybody's been burning grassland so far and is used to a faster rate of spread. This is going to be a slower rate of spread. It's going to take it longer for the fire to move through. When we do forest burns, one danger is always reburn. You'll notice as we burn through, it does not completely consume the litter. The litter on the bottom is moisture. The fire will go out when it gets there. But what it does mean is the fire will sweep through and it could dry out some of that bottom litter. So you could set the stage for another burn to go right through that area. That's always a possibility, so be on the lookout for that. A prescribed fire is the controlled application of fire to wild lands. We're just preparing the lines before we start a little test fire to see what fire behavior is going to look like. And if fire behavior is as predicted, then we're going to ignite the unit. Specified conditions allow the fire to be confined to a predetermined area. These fires are done only under very specific prescriptions 
related to field condition. Before you do prescribed fire, there's a, a very in-depth plan and analysis that is done, and there's very specific criteria that have to be met. Wind speed, humidity, both of the air and humidity of the, uh, what they call the fine fuels, the one-hour fuels, and the ten-hour fuels. Uh, if you notice, they're constantly checking the weather throughout the uh, uh, entire incident to make sure that all these conditions stay within prescription parameters. If they go out of prescription, we stop the burn. We have several objectives to this exercise. One is ecological, to provide a natural habitat for the animals in uh, the Wertheim area. We've got the other objective of reducing fuel load. In case there is a wildland fire, this will help suppress the wildland fire by making the wildfire not so intense. But the other objective is a training aspect and an informational aspect. You're providing the informational uh, venue and we do have some people on our crew that have limited experience or no experience at all and that's that's where the training comes in. When a wildfire burns in a recently burned area there is a greater degree of safety for the firefighter due to fuel load reduction. The reduction of dead needles, leaves and branches as a result of the prescribed burns helps prevent dangerous wildfire behavior. You realize why we're not moving on to the next next block. We've dried out much too much. You saw the intensities and the behaviors today. Uh, it could be worse if we moved on to the next block, so that's why we're not. All right? That's all part of the prescription. You stay within your prescription and you cut down on the accident. We wanted to conduct a light burn. We wanted to keep the forest overstory intact, but we wanted to rejuvenate the understory and reduce the leaf litter. This benefits certain types of wildlife, what we've created here. In a month, two months from now, the understory vegetation will poke up and will be more nutritious for certain types of wildlife. And it's a different type of structure for different wildlife species and stands that haven't been burned recently. With effective planning, a prescribed fire management program can benefit the Central Pine Barrens Fire Suppression Program, as well as meet ecological goals. Well, we're here at the uh, trailer camping area at the Sears Bellows County Park in Hampton Bays, Long Island. Most folks will have for their camping shelters a tent or a trailer or um, a pop-up camper, and they all tend to bring the same type of equipment. They've got their lawn furniture and tables, and most importantly, they're looking to have a place to have a fire, a place to cook their meals. What we like to recommend is some basic rules. We say no ground fires. We're very concerned about folks building a fire directly on the ground or in the ground. That heat or those coals can actually transfer underground into the root system of many of the plant materials and actually begin a fire. You may not see it because fire can travel underground. It can be smoldering. So we ask that they keep the fire elevated off the ground and contained. For example, here we have a burn container for uh, general campground use. Usually folks will use something like this for uh, sitting around a campfire in the evening uh, for additional light, toasting marshmallows, that type of thing. Uh, we'll also provide for them, or if we don't provide them, they must bring their own barbecue grills, hibachis, uh, perhaps a small propane stove. Over here we have a typical example of the uh, barbecue grills that are available. They can be run with charcoal or we have in the burn barrels they use native materials. They'll go out and gather their own wood or sometimes uh, folks will bring their own campground uh, fuel with them, any wood from home. You're building your campfire. Uh, it's best to start with small twigs and branches, perhaps maybe some newspaper or some small dried leaves to get the fire going and that's fine. Many people also though bring other items to the park. We've got a generator over here and a gas can. Folks will use the generators to run oh an air conditioner in their trailer or their television set and that's fine but they're way too close to the trailer. They should not be that close and once that generator is fueled that gasoline should be well removed from your campsite, your trailer area or your tent. You might want to use charcoal lighter to ignite your charcoal for cooking fires, and that's okay. But once you've got it on the charcoal, prior to lighting it, remove that fuel source away from the charcoal fire. 
Uh, as far as your regular campfire, you don't want to be lighting that or igniting that with gasoline or kerosene. Uh, common sense really prevails with that. Uh, people use the uh, lights, uh, for instance, a propane light or a Holman-type lantern, which has a fuel uh, for lighting the campsites. That's okay, but they shouldn't bring that lantern inside their tent or their trailer. They should keep it well away. You always try to keep a certain amount of area away from your tent and trailer, cleaned out, so you don't ignite the undergrowth or the uh, branches. If there's not a faucet or a hose available right on your campsite, you should have a bucket of water right there for emergency use. You should try to have a shovel. That can be used to throw sand or dirt on the fire for extinguishing it. One thing we're always uh, trying to be sure that our campers or any camper follows is that when they're finished with a campfire, when they're finished with their cooking fire, that it's completely extinguished. Uh, what that means is uh, you let the fire die down, you stir the ashes, you completely douse it with water, stir it again, make sure there's no hot coals and douse it again, make sure it's fully extinguished, and then and only then, even the next morning when it's totally cold ashes, and say, can you dispose of the ashes? You should not dump them in the woods either, because if there was any uh, hot ashes left, they could still ignite a fire. People who live in wildland areas should establish some safety parameters for themselves. One, uh, they should have some type of fire resistant outer shell to their homes. Many times they have just wood shingles, some of them have wood roofing and everything. Obviously, any type of fire that comes up to that area with sparks can easily ignite their homes. In addition, it's nice to be part of the forest, but they need to assure that the forest doesn't become part of their house. They need to maintain a space between their home and the vegetation, creating a natural fire break. Uh, in addition, a lot of people have trees growing right next to their houses. Fire that would burn right up to this house is going to ignite those trees. That house is going to burn. So people need to make sure their houses are properly protected through the construction and also then through the clear area surrounding their homes. It's very important for emergency services to be able to find your home during that time of emergency. So we need you to post your street number clearly so it's visible from the street and uh, we need to see it at night also. So using reflective numbers uh, assist us greatly. If you have a mobile home, skirting is very important and uh, because that comes in contact with the ground, you want to use something that's fire resistive or non-combustible. Uh, and it's important that you maintain your skirting so that no vegetation can grow or leaves or needles can accumulate under your mobile home as that will provide, again, fuel for a fire. Uh, that can transmit from the ground to your mobile home. If you have a fire, you should call your local fire department. You should have their number posted on your telephone, and if you're not sure, you can always call 911 to report a fire or other emergency. You should think about the need to evacuate before it becomes an emergency. Uh, you should pack some things, you should have your house prepared, and you should have your emergency route uh, planned out. And if you decide to leave, it's very important that you take a few minutes to prepare your home for uh, that evacuation. You should close all of your windows and you should make sure that you draw back the drapes or curtains. Uh, radiant heat can go right through the glass and it can actually ignite the curtains inside your home even with the windows closed. So that's a, an important last step to do if you need to leave your home during a fire emergency. Well, in the particular case of the wildfire task force, uh, the commission after the 1995 wildfires uh, brought together three dozen organizations approximately. That sense expanded. And the reason for that was to try to increase the amount of interagency and interorganizational communication that occurs. Uh, those agencies are roughly divided into half of them being fire districts or fire departments with obvious responsibilities for fire and the other half being organizations that either own land within the Central Pine Barren, such as the parks departments that we, were, which own the area that we're in today, or uh, areas such as the fire marshal's office, investigators, arson squad, uh, the National Guard. Since the fire, uh, the Sunrise Fire that we had in 95, uh, all the different groups of uh, agencies have, have kind of uh, got on the same page. Uh, we talk the same language. Uh, 
and we're very easy to get a hold of one another. You know, we, it took us three days to get the planes here, and, and now I feel as if we can do it in uh, four or five hours because the different groups have pulled together. Since the 1995 wildfires, um, we determined the Wildfire Task Force itself saw a need to have a fire weather indexing. Uh, we didn't have that in 1995. We do, prior to 1995, there was, we never used a fire weather index. Now that we have this fire weather indexing system, when we do get into high and extreme conditions, we um, close public access to parks and to nature trails when necessary to prevent the human factor of being in the woods off the trails of possibly preventing uh, forest fires from starting and also keeping ATVs off the road and other stuff. The New York State Forest Rangers provide continuous training for both the New York Air and Army National Guard air crews to help promote prompt assistance from the Guard should the region be hit with events similar to the Long Island wildfires of 1995. If the fire is so intense that, the, that they can't get close to the fire, then the uh, helicopters work quite well in the fact that it knocks the fire down and slows the fire up so that your fire forces can get in close to the fire. And then there are certain areas w sometimes where you have a spot fire or a breakout and the helicopter can be dousing the water on the fire so that the fire companies have a chance to respond to that particular area. The guard members are also performing in-flight training. What we do in those drills is be able to provide an education basis for the helicopter pilots and also for the crew that is on the helicopter. It's very difficult with a helicopter when you're looking at the horizon to be able to lower the helicopter down, fill up a water bucket of 600 gallons and pick the water bucket up and then fly over to the scene. And then once you're over to the scene, when we tell them to release the water, that 600 gallons or almost 5,000 pounds of water being released all at once. So you have a tendency for the helicopter to lift up automatically and the helicopter pilots and the crews have to be able to manipulate uh, eye-hand coordination and understand what the water is doing or the uh, release of the weight load is doing. Each fall, the New York Wildfire and Incident Management Academy provides specialized training to firefighters and emergency management personnel. The Central Pine Barrens is a natural wonder that is ours to enjoy, experience, and explore. While fire continues to play an important role in shaping the Pine Barrens ecosystems, uncontrolled fire poses a significant threat, especially in wildland urban interface areas. The many members of the Pine Barrens Wildfire Task Force work hard to promote wildfire prevention and awareness, but they can't do it alone. Without everyone's participation and cooperation, we will all pay the price for uncontrolled wildfire damage to our Pine Barrens, our homes, and our communities. The fate of the Pine Barrens is in our hands.